Hello, welcome. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk. Um, is it too loud? No? I'm going to talk about uh, Zen and skydiving. But first, I have a warning. I speak fast. Uh, I'm trying to slow down. They try to teach me. I'm uh, renowned for my really bad humor. I'm sure there's someone from HR sitting in the back uh, thinking, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, this is. And I'm somewhat of a uh, keynote wizard. So <laughs> be prepared. I was, the born, uh, I was born the youngest of three children. I'm uh, the Benjamin. I'm the guy in the middle here. Um, I have flappy ears, and we do not speak about the flappy ears. This is a different uh, talk. So, I was always competing with my bigger brothers. My parents stimulated this competition, and they always urged us to set goals and achieve them. When I got an eight, eight at school, my dad asked, why wasn't it a nine? When I got a nine at school, he asked, why wasn't it a ten? It was always half-joking, but not completely. There was always a, sort of a core of truth, and they urged us to work harder, better, faster, stronger. And it stuck with me. Now, I need goals, and I will work really hard to achieve them. But the downside of being goal-driven is that it can limit you. It can limit your view. Now, I remember I joined the Alp d'Huez initiative a while back um, to bike up the Alp d'Huez uh, six times in one, in one day to gather uh, money for uh, cancer research. I bought a bike, I put together a team, and I trained and trained and trained and trained. This is also me in the middle with really cool glasses. Um, and then there was the day itself, and we biked up the mountain again and again and again. And then afterwards, I never touched my bike again. So if anybody's interested in a giant TCR, come uh, visit me. So always when I'm at the finish line, I'm already looking for a new one. And the same applied to my house, where I spent literally every free hour for nine months working on this house. And when I was done, and I was sitting in the garden, someone asked me, wow, it must really be nice sitting here now, right? And I said yes, but all that I can think about was all the stuff that I still had to do. I needed to do the shed, and the, and the, the wall, and the, the flooring. I always felt like, what's the next job? Uh, and I thought, so what happens after all these goals? Is it just a life filled with chasing goals? Um, and by the way, if you think this is a classic first world problem, it is. I'm an educated, white, straight male living in Western Europe with enough money to buy a house, go on vacation, and make my own choices. I know I'm privileged, but so are all of you. So this is also your first world problem now. So this was my first first world problem, thinking in goals and goals alone. The second problem that I was, or am, always quite competitive about reaching them. Being the Benjamin, all stereotypes apply to me, the younger brother. I always feel, felt the need to prove myself. Big mouth, sharp jokes. I mean, look at me, I'm kind of like a baboon. <laughs> now, baboon's order of hierarchy are determined by who's strongest, but also whose butt is bigger and redder. <laughs> and there's no shortage of other baboons here at depth. There's a bit of an alpha male culture. And a lot of baboons to compare butts with, and it's not necessarily the best place for relaxing, sitting back, and enjoying the things you've achieved. This is also the feedback I got back from work every year during evaluation talks. It's not necessary to prove yourself all the time, Wouter. And I know, but how to stop what you've been brought up with and what you've been doing all your life. Now, I was not only just proving it to myself, I was also forcing other people to perform a certain way using unorthodox tactics. This is a printer icon. <laughs> For instance, at Dead Rotterdam, I sit right next to the printer. And every Friday, I got really annoyed by the huge stack of prints that's lying there, not collected by anyone. So I started checking the printer's history, because this printer has a printer history with mail addresses. And I mailed people, hey, come get your print. It was so important to print 58 pages worth of song lyrics, please come get them. <laughs> and often they didn't. But also, luckily, at Dept, we have a thing called Dept uh, Facebook at Work, or Workplace. Um, it's kind of like a Dept, uh, a private Facebook for only dead people. 
And I started making posts like this one. And I started tagging the people that left their prints. I, I mean, we're all colleagues, right? I thought it was a lot of fun. I, I added some humor. <laughs> <coughs> Are you done? Or at least what I thought was funny. Uh, but maybe it's not really humor for everyone. Maybe you see the baboon behavior, the big mouth, the sharp jokes, the competitive part of me. I once tagged someone on her first day on the job, and it was not the welcome she imagined, and I'm still sorry for it, Faye. <laughs> I am. So somewhere in the back of my mind, I realized things should be different or could be different, less forced, less goal-oriented, less baboonishly, intrusively competitive. But I had no idea how, until two years ago when I made my first skydive. And the ingredients are your own parachute and two instructors. So I'm going to show you the first jump, which is supposed to start now. So this is us in the plane. That's me. I have two instructors with me. That's 14,000 feet. That's just a little under five kilometers. And here we jump. Luckily, they hold me. And where it takes about three, four seconds, and then you're going 200 kilometers an hour. And that's me going nuts. <laughs> so um, what's happening inside my head right now when you're jumping out of an airplane for the first time at 200 kilometers an hour? Basically, every <laughs> sense in your body is screaming, you're going to die, do something, you're going to die. Uh, in the end, of course, I landed safely. I'm right here. I'll uh, show you how my chute was opened. I needed a little bit of help. <laughs> now it's there. Okay, and then you land. If you compare this to my sixth jump, just a few days later, so this is the jump where you jump out on your back. You wait three seconds, and then you turn and the instructor approaches you. Now, what you see now is I'm completely in the moment. I'm completely relaxed. And this is important because basically jumping from 14,000 feet, you have a little less than one minute of free fall time. That's one minute of going 200 kilometers an hour before your parachute opens and you drift down 10 kilometers an hour. It sounds like nothing, right? One minute? That's just enough time to pick your nose or swipe your iPhone right three times. The amazing thing is, when you get better at skydiving, this one minute becomes 10 minutes. I can now exit the plane, do two saltos, two corkscrews, two ways, turn both ways, look around, and I still have 20 seconds left. It's really amazing. You notice every millisecond because of the ultra focus you have. Every particle of every second counts. You're living every one of them. So obviously, I wanted every minute to be like this. Every minute, not thinking about the next one, but the one you're in. So suddenly, I was more open for living in the moment. And this is my first world solution for your first world problem. It's not drink clean water, use a condom, admit there are only two genders, but <laughs> live in the moment. <laughs> so I finally took up my neighbor's offer, who's a Zen master, uh, for a free month of Zen training, Zen meditation training. I'd considered this offer before, but I never got around to it. And plus, it would not help me go over any finish line. And sitting in the lotus position doesn't really add to your cool baboon behavior. But now I get it. After the first basic course, I get it, Zen. Basically, <coughs> sorry, it's really hot, huh? Zen revolves around suffering and how we can solve it. We basically suffer because we long and crave. You long for things that have been, and you crave for things to come, which prevents us from actually enjoying what's right in front of you, the present. What meditation does is that it helps you to focus on the here and now. So twice a day, you sit in this lotus position, holding your hands like that, and you breathe in, and you breathe out, and you count to one. You breathe in, and you breathe out, and count to two. You breathe in, you count up to 10, and then it starts all over. And you do this for 20 minutes. Can you guys imagine sitting still 20 minutes, not doing anything, no phones, nothing, in your busy schedule twice a day? 
yet you spend easily five, that, that amount, uh, five times that amount scrolling through screens or watching TV. So, let's try. I know this is something everybody can do, I promise, but the beginning is always hardest, so I'll help you. Everyone, and I mean everyone, there's cameras, even the people standing outside, please close your eyes halfway, hold your hands like this, Yes, and I will count, I will follow my breathing and count to 10 and I will, we will do this for a minute and I will start right now. Okay, go. One. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. One. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not done. This was the <laughs> I'm not done with the talk. So how was it? What did you feel? There was something in the room, right? Because you share this moment. And how long did the minute take now? It felt pretty long, right? That's what a minute can feel like. So how does meditation help me with my first world problems? Basically, by training your mind to focus on your breath, you can focus your mind to differentiate between more and less important things in real life. It's interesting how falling towards the earth at 200, 200 kilometers an hour gives me the same state, as state of mind as sitting motionless on a pillow for 20 minutes. So I do both now. I skydive at least every three months and I meditate at least once a day, either right after my morning shower or right after dinner. The effects of only a few weeks of meditation help me a great deal and they differ a lot between people, but for me, I sleep better, I'm more focused on things that matter and I react less impulsively and have a better grasp of my emotions. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I don't feel like competing to be the upper baboon, at least not all of the time. And most interesting for me, and I think what you will discover if you try it, is that you learn a great deal about yourself. Because you kind of self-reflect on stuff when you're sitting motionless on a pillow for 20 minutes. Because it's like looking in the mirror and there's only you, unless there's more people and you have another problem. <laughs> more importantly, I appreciate what I have a bit more and a bit more consciously. Now, the best thing about this talk, you don't have to jump out of a plane, I did that for you. You only need to remember the minute we just experienced. And tomorrow you add four minutes and you meditate for five. And the week after you add another five minutes, you're meditating for 10, until you're at 20 minutes. It's 20 minutes to change your life, solve your first world problem, and prevent all those midlife and quarter life crises you're about to have. And yes, I'm also looking at all the millennials in this room. So try it out, it only costs you time. Become a Zen master of your emotions, or a baboon throwing poo at people, it's up to you. Now, I realize very much that some of you are thinking, ah, I don't mind, I enjoy my minutes, I'm very conscious about my time, I don't need this stuff. So, I challenge you to see if you're right. For one day, one day, go through every doorway with your right foot. If you succeed, you're right, and you can forget about any minutes I just told you about. Some of you, I can see the faces, going, meh, <laughs> how difficult can that be? Well, basically, it's impossible. I felt the same thing when my Zen teacher uh, asked me. It's next to impossible because while we're walking, we tend to think about our destination we, and what we're going to do there. Think about it. When you're in your living room and you're about to make coffee, 
You walk to your kitchen, you don't think about the walking. You think about, ah, oh, the kitchen and the coffee and the cup. We're not enjoying the road. We're not enjoying the pathway. This is because you're not living in the moment at the same time. Most people can't do this challenge for half an hour, let alone a day. But think about it. Try it. Prove me wrong. And if it doesn't work, think about the 20, 20 minutes we just talked about. Thank you.